those were 10 bucks a piece. 10 bucks a piece was just retail price for those. I just sold my 10 set. Yeah. Yeah. 13,000. 13,000. Yeah. yeah. There you go. <laughs> Cause I, I had a ton of it and those were, that was just the price they, they were going for at the time. So it What's is what ton? it is. What's a ton. Cause it's not, these, a... these terms are always relevant. All right. Okay. That's absolutely true. I would say. Welcome back, guys, to the Hokey Radar Podcast. Today, we're shooting, recording episode, what did I say, seven? What did you say? Seventh, seventh episode. Epi this is the seventh episode, almost two months in now. Um, this is uh, a first-time guest. I never, we never really had the chance to uh, yep. to record back in the day when I was doing this, and uh, you know, years ago, but... Um, He's been, gosh, you broke 100K subs not too long ago. Uh, investment collecting style channel. This is uh, the 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 great twist, Bake Jake. I know that. Oh, that thank you arrived. so much, man. I really appreciate that. <laughs> I I honestly I remember um, trying to get you on beforehand. Yeah, and, yeah, and I absolutely you were a hermit. apologize for that. Yeah, <laughs> no, I apologize for that. And there's a lot of that goes into that. So I'm a hobbyist. A lot of people, yeah. they do content full-time right now. I don't okay. do content full-time. I still okay. have a full-time job that I do on the day. So okay. back when you were reaching out to me during the pandemic time, uh, unfortunately, I was working full-time and I was taking uh, MBA classes or master level classes Ooh. at night. And on nights where I wasn't going to college classes, I would do content. So it was a oh. lot to juggle at the same time. Uh, with my family and friends and all that. And you you understand that, especially with being a content creator as well. So it was just a lot. And right now, you know, I don't have classes any longer. So it gives me some more free time. And especially yeah. after Card Party, when we built all those connections, I definitely wanted to reach out and just uh, connect with you guys as much as I can. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, kudos to you for staying focused on what was actually important mm -hmm. and not overextending yourself. Uh, I think yeah, that's probably so a, on, at least a good my reason end, why you're successful. <laughs> yeah, at least on my end, I always advocate that collecting is always a hobby. I try to make it a hobby. So for me, it was never meant to be a career goal. I never wanted to do uh, card collecting or uh, investing or trading full time, anything of that nature. And I feel like that's what a lot of people enjoy. They enjoy doing it a little bit on the side. And I'm sure you 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 collect all kinds of different stuff. And that's just the way it goes sometimes. So is that is that not where it's headed? I mean, you just said you knocked out your MBA. Yep. You, you got your nine to five. Are you headed towards full time at this point? No. Or are you not? You have no interest. I, I can. That's the thing. I've had so many opportunities to go full time, but I prefer it as a hobby. Wow. And that's something that uh, I, I'm really passionate about collecting, of yeah. course. But at the same time, if I go into it full time, I think I might experience burnout. That's something yeah. that can happen. So wow. I love that I can just collect whenever I feel like it. If I don't need to think about Pokemon cards for a week or two, I absolutely can. I can go on vacation if I feel like it. And that's just the work-life balance that I have. Man, I wish I had that, that mentality. I know. <laughs> I know. I've talked to so many of the other content creators and they are shocked uh, by my schedule compared to other people's because yeah. pretty much everyone does it full time. Right. At this point, yeah. everyone especially going through the pandemic, people just were like, it's, it's, uh, I talked about this with, uh, catch them all with Dan mm -hmm. about how I was always chasing the next shiny thing and so inconsistent, yeah. but, uh, yeah, ev everybody at this point is like trying to take that leap to be a full-time content creator, a full-time Pokemon seller, yeah. whatever it is. And I don't think people realize how incredibly, I mean, difficult it is, first of all, but Ooh, yeah how much it destroys the sense of what the hobby is to you before yeah. you do that. Cause I, I remember, I mean, I was, I'm working a nine to five now again with, yeah. uh, I'm working at rare candy with Lee, but yeah. prior, you know, to all this craziness, I was selling robotics, robotic arms mm -hmm. for industrial automation mm -hmm. and, you know, Pokemon was just on the side and it was incredibly fun. <laughs> I could do it when I chose, like you said, I could do it when I felt like mm -hmm. it, when I got home, it was a great tool for just like letting off steam and kind of yeah. getting into a place where I could be happy because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you get so, so sucked into, uh, working your job in this, this mundane life, I guess. And, and, you know, um, 
I wasn't content. I wasn't happy with it, which I wish yeah. I was because that no matter what you do, being content, mm -hmm. finding that, that, that plain, just balance of like, this is what I do every day and I love it. Yeah. Or, I hate it, but I'm okay with it. <laughs> like, yeah, that's happiness to me. <laughs> totally understand. I completely yeah. get that. Uh, for me, it's always been, you know, I enjoy the calmness of it. And yeah. then every now and again, when Pokemon releases something new, I jump right into the hype, you know, when 151 first was announced and I saw some of the first cards instantly, like my mind was blown and I was tweeting about it, showing yeah. off pictures of it, talking about it immediately. But if there's a period of calm, right, if there's no major news or there's nothing crazy going on in the hobby, I can take a step back. We can do something relaxing for a while until the, the next wave of uh, hype or interest just jumps right back in and I'm back in the hobby again. See, that's the type of energy that we need to push out there more so that people mm -hmm. aren't getting over, over their, uh, aren't overextending themselves, yeah. both financially, but energy wise. Um, you know, thankfully, uh, the Pokemon helped me financially, <laughs> but mm -hmm. the energy wise, I extend myself uh, still on a daily basis because there's so many conversations I'm having, I'm having, I'm doing the podcast, I have a full resale business uh i have distributors i you know i do mm -hmm. so much that energy wise i extend myself so i yeah i figured out the financial side at least for now but the energy side is just uh, a whole nother difficult battle i'm dealing with yeah totally totally understand i think every content creators especially on the trading card side they've had those thoughts at some point or another where they get big enough where they say you know do i want to start selling trading cards do i want to start selling sealed products if I were to become a distributor and sell, you know, the latest Scarlet and Violet set, I'm sure I could be successful at it, but that's just something that I don't want to do. I don't <laughs> want to be shipping hundreds of boxes a day. If that's yeah. what someone wants to do, totally super cool. It's just not where my head is at. I love mm. it as a hobby. You know, I love just showing off cool cards and talking about it. And that's where I like it to stay. Yeah. Well, this is great. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to finally get to, to, to talk with you and meet with you. I don't know if I've seen you on any podcasts or, or you said this you, is my first one. It's your there first you go. one. That's fantastic. So uh, I'm definitely going to dive in, try to get to know you, yeah. personal life, your business life, what's going on with Twice Baked Jake. Mm -hmm. Because um, again, like you, when did you, when did you start really? Did you start in the pandemic or just before? Just before. So I can definitely dive a little bit into that. So I started collecting Pokemon cards, I think around seven or eight years ago. That was when oh. I was in college. And uh, First, I was like, not even as a yeah. kid. You know, well, I mean, I, I mean, everyone had Pokemon cards as a kid. So, so that's when I was introduced okay. to it. But of course, I, yeah. when I became an adult and I turned 20, you know, 22 and I How started getting, I'm 29 right now. Okay. I'm Do 30, I look 29? So. Uh, no. I look young, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, it's an, the lack of beard will do that. But I'm the beard right helped, yeah. I, yeah. I take the beard off. I, I look like I'm 12. <laughs> exactly. So. <laughs> so I started collecting when I was in college, you know, working at a textbook store, making minimal wage at like $7.25. And mm -hmm. any money I was scraping by, I would yeah. buy like base set booster packs and jungle booster packs. And really? Yeah. And those Wait, were. What, the... where, where'd you go to college? Uh, Nevada, University of Nevada. Okay. So, oh, you're from Vegas? Or... Yeah. No, I'm from oh, Reno, or, but uh, I moved to Reno. Vegas. Yeah. Moved to Vegas. Okay. Oh, wow. Yeah. I, I don't know why we've never connected. I used to go to Vegas all the time to hang out with Gary and stuff, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay. So even, so you started, you picked it back up in college. See, I waited till yeah. after college. Yeah. So Which you makes must total been, sense too. Yeah. You must've been getting base at packs for what? Like 10 yeah, bucks? They, oh my goodness. They were cheap. I'll tell you a story right now. Okay. Back in the day when you buy booster packs, some vendors would throw in freebies you know, freebies if you buy <laughs> stuff from them. So yeah. people message me and be like, hey man, if you buy some base at booster packs for me, I'll throw in a couple of jungle booster packs for free. And you know, like <laughs> a jungle booster packs, like what, $100 nowadays? And people yeah. are just tossing those in there for free because wow. that was just the going price at the time. And I, I mean, everyone has stories like that. Yeah. But so why did I start doing content, right? So I started doing content right before the pandemic. This was like around 2018. And yeah. that's just because I was watching a lot of content creators, the same ones that, uh, you know, everyone else was. I've Who? seen the Lean Hard or the Real Breaking Nate okay. uh, pack openings. And there were cards that I was really excited about. 
and no one was talking about them. Things like the Mario Pikachu or the Japanese promos. You know, someone might open something or show something here or there, but no one was really doing any deep dives into all these really cool cards. So I was like, oh my goodness, why is no one talking about this? This is such a great part of the hobby. And I think these cards have so much potential. So I literally start my channel just so that I can enthuse other people and find other people that are excited about the same things that I am. Okay. So all right, we're going to, we're going to dive into this more. So yeah. you, what, what made you rediscover the Pokemon cards and back in college, yeah. what yeah. your base set and stuff like that? Was that, it couldn't have been Leonhardt in them back then. What, what, yeah. no, so, what was that? So I think there's an innate to every collector. You know, I am a collector at heart. If I'm mm -hmm. not collecting Pokemon cards, I'll probably be collecting something else. And that may be similar to you. You probably have things that are part of your collection that are not trading cards, you know, but okay. I'll collect all kinds of stuff when it comes to music records, Funko Pops, um, autographs, vintage stuff from historical figures, you name it. You know, I just like collecting stuff. And so one of the things that I love is Pokemon. And I always remember not having a base set Charizard. So, of course, I picked up a base set Charizard, <laughs> and that's how it starts. And I start watching, you know, some of the big content creators open up booster packs, you know, uh, Max Mofo even, and a bunch of other content creators. Yeah. And just seeing them open packs, and I thought, man, they're just opening up packs. There's no one that's really doing discussion-style videos. There were some, but it was very few. And, of course, that's everywhere now. Everyone's doing discussion-style videos. But it didn't exist really four years yeah. ago. And I was part of that initial wave of people just excitedly talking about how do we actually collect these long term, and especially on the Japanese side, because everyone was standoffish on the Japanese side. There was some cool stuff on the Japanese side, but the language barrier was definitely a large part of it. And just yeah. letting people understand like, hey, th these cards are so cool, and they just are not available in English. You just got to go for them if you want them. It has to be Japanese. Yeah. I, um, my dad was a, is a coin collector, so I picked up yeah. that that habit from him. I mean, he like pushed sports cards and stuff on us. And I had my older brothers to follow for, for Pokemon and magic and Dragon Ball Z and everything else. And, um, in college I was kind of like buying and collecting like vintage clothing, weird sweatshirts, like Disney stuff and, uh, designer brand, like old vintage stuff that I could find at, at, um, Salvation Army and all that. So, um, yeah, then I picked up once i heard about evolutions coming out because yeah. that was a base set reprint and then pokemon yep. go so like th those two things together ev evolutions at pokemon go combining was like it for me that brought me back into pokemon discovering gem at pokemon who was grading cards and looking at all mm -hmm. these vintage stuff and completing his collection and all these other guys of course rusty tca gaming and mm -hmm. finding e4 the forum and connecting with a bunch of pokemon nerds uh yeah exactly like time, same here like you know blew up, right the, um, the e4 forum like that's yeah. so old now like who yeah. uses a forum anymore but that's where it started <laughs> as you know and like with sm pratt and looking mm -hmm. at all these other content creators and that's where it really started for me as well so um I, so, since you dived into like first thing was like opening base set packs or buying base set packs yeah what did you get up like how, how did you go about collecting i think it's pretty similar for yeah for all of us right like i stopped at gym challenge as a kid so yeah when i got back into it that's all i cared to get yeah i was buying base at the gym challenge just no sky ridge i don't want sky ridge <laughs> oh e-series I, I don't want that it <laughs> yeah, took yeah, me it I took me a that. while to get used to it right no 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 um what, was, was that kind of similar for you were you like just buying well, exactly the same so when i got jumped back into it you know there was so much going on i didn't really understand ex cards or any right. of those more modern stuff so i was like all right let's collect base set we're gonna kind of finish out base set and i actually you know just by collecting base set you learn so much about the hobby you learn about the rarity the condition the hollow patterns all those things just by collecting the base set you learn so much about and mm -hmm. collecting base set i think the complete i just collected the unlimited one just to, you know, that's something that you start with. I think collecting all of that costs like 150 bucks for the whole entire original base set in mint yeah. condition too, for yeah. all the cards. And uh, as soon as I finished that, I did, okay, let's do jungle, let's do fossil. And like just one set after another, I started collecting them. And then, you know, after you get to a certain point, you're like, well, I'm not going to collect every set. So what do I start liking? 
And so that's when you start diversifying and getting to something that you're really into. And for me, that was like, whoa, the Japanese promo card just blew my mind because you sort of have an idea for what a Pokemon card is, you know, with the yellow border, a basic portrait, and that's really it. And once the 2017, 2018 timeframe started coming around, they start doing some really crazy stuff with the cards going, you know, with spectacular art that is it barely a Pokemon card anymore. It's just an art piece. Right. And at a certain point, I was like, I got to have these. So that's yeah. when you become a specialized collector almost. Yeah, it took me a while to warm up the full arts. It was yeah. it was tough. I, I Same here. appreciated the old style so much more. And, and like, it still does something to you when you look at it versus like a modern card. It's just like the borders are slightly thinner. The card yeah. stock is slightly thinner. It's just something that I hold on to because I'm just old at this oh, point and stuck same, in my ways. Same here, man. Same yeah. here. When I started, um, so many people reach out to me and they would say like, hey, man, I love collecting Pokemon cards and I want to collect the four trainer cards. What do you think? And I would tell them, you know, you probably don't want to collect the four trainer cards. You should probably <laughs> stick to the Pokemon because, you know, they're a little bit more memorable. So I would mm -hmm. advise people in that direction. And over the past couple of years, my opinions of the four trainer cards have changed a little bit where I say, okay, the modern ones, they're pretty gorgeous and people are going to want these. So I'm yeah. someone who can have my opinions weighed as well. So I didn't like four cards, especially <laughs> the trainers. I thought the XY right. ones were garbage. They didn't look good. So that's my hot take right there. I and, mean, that, that was one of your recent videos too. Of like, here's yeah. my update on my full art trainer <laughs> collection. Yeah. Like, that's what you've been doing. That's yeah. Amazing. So, so my opinion have changed. And that's yeah. something as a collector should happen with you is that you should grow with the hobby and your passion to sort of move and sway. Yeah, that's good. Now, like, how were you, how are you getting this, this, uh, the early stuff that you mentioned, like the Mario Pikachus and the ponchos, were you just buying off of eBay or? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I don't have a lot of connections, so that's the same way I think anyone would really start is you just see what's available out there and you would pick them up. And when I was picking those product up, you know, like the screen promos, those were 10 bucks a piece, 10 bucks a piece was just retail price for those. I just sold my Mark. 10 set. Yeah. Yeah. 13,000. 13,000. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I, had okay. to. I sold a PSA 10 set, I think for $500 a couple of years ago, because I, I had a ton and those yeah. were, that was just the price they, they were going for at the time. So it What's is what ton? it is. What's a ton? Cause it's not, these, these terms are always yeah, relative. All right. Okay, that's absolutely true. I would say like a dozen copies of each. Okay. So okay. it's that's a lot for yeah. I mean for a car yeah. like that, but it's not excessive. And right. those cars were going for 10 bucks at a time, and I absolutely loved them, and I knew I needed additional copies. So that's mm -hmm. what I had, and I you know slowly slowed off a couple, and I'm not selling any more of them because I okay. don't have a ton anymore. But I still <laughs> well, have I, enough. That, yeah. I I had the original first tens because I was in Japan during the release. And oh, I see. I, I picked up two sets of each. Yeah. Um, you know, I was sitting outside the Pokemon Center trying mm -hmm. to use Google Translate to buy these <laughs> these cards. Yeah. Uh, I got the Mimikus at the at the um the the museum because that's the mm -hmm. only place you could get them. And then the other three were at Pokemon Center. I I got Pikachu later because Pikachu came out. Yeah, it was Pikachu. December. I think was the last one. Yeah. So, I, I I it breaks my heart to have sold those, but you know. It's a lot of money <laughs> and yeah. I'll pick up a nine set at some point sure. or something or a overall sure. set and still have the same attachment to them. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that, that, uh, I don't have any copies anymore. I just had the two sets. I wish I, like I saw it firsthand. I totally mm -hmm. should have just went crazy, especially on the Mimikyu's <laughs> and yeah. I didn't. Um, but that's, that's one thing that like holds me back a little bit where you just mentioned, you said you don't have a lot of these connections, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you might have more now, but mm -hmm. um, when you don't have those connections or uh, even like a full, like, like breadth of knowledge of what, how these cards are released or sold in Japan, mm -hmm. you just go to eBay and you buy them and it's yep. the best price available to you. Yeah. For me, I was like, okay, I know X, I know so many different places to get it, all the different price points that people are buying it. And I get stingy and I won't buy on eBay and I'll I wait know. until I could buy from this one person who only has I a couple of I completely get that. I completely you know? get that. So there's this, this knowledge balance of like, just 
buy it if you really like it and you yeah. really see potential and don't try to pinch pennies the pennies for like I, I have said that exact thing. same advice because long term you know what's a couple of dollars here or there you know if you bought it for 10 bucks because you had insider connection and i bought it for 20 bucks because i used ebay five years from now that's not going to be the major making point of the difference the breaking point is whether you bought it or not do you even have the card that's and that happened to me again with the unagaba <laughs> evolution yeah. I, I ordered a few hundred hundred of them from japan but they all got canceled everyone I, every single one i had them oh, at crazy. like nine dollars a piece yeah and i could have bought them for twelve dollars a piece fifteen dollars a yeah. piece off of ebay and got them all but yeah the, i, I did an order from the pokemon center so i i got okay. 10 copies because that was my limit and that's all mm -hmm. i got and that's fine too because those yeah. were you know part of the promotion so i just got stuff for free pretty much right right so is that still your focus is the the japanese stuff because it's finally like it the modern has finally outpaced english yeah like it was always popular it was always fun to get you get it first but the pricing has actually gone crazy yes, <laughs> so absolutely like is yeah. that are you still bullish on on japanese even with the the pricing being what it is today yeah for me specifically i think the modern japanese sets are probably the best sets you could ever open you know stuff like v max climax v star universe those sets are insane like the special even so yeah those specialty sets are absolutely insane they're like our crown zenith which is super popular but mm -hmm. even better than crown zenith so Why is for it better me, well for me it's better because you know you got god booster packs the quality's better okay. uh okay. they got way better pulls you get a secret rare inside of every box uh, there's so many reasons every okay. pack you get um you get a v or ex card or gx card or whatever immediately there's mm -hmm. so much in those that the English side just never catches up to. Even when I'm opening up Crown Zenith, I get disheartened because I would say 80% of it is probably a nine or lower just because of the quality. I see inking, I see whitening, just about every single kind of condition issue you can think of, uh, they're on the card. So, so, so you don't see, I you like don't it. see an opportunity there then for English cards being no, oh cool, less, there's definitely lower an opportunity. quality than you know harder tens could that i mean it obviously it's printed i think way more than japanese yeah. but yeah. with that being the case wouldn't that be a positive opportunity or potential opportunity for people to oh, yeah. go in on english and just go oh yeah there's the there's tens. definitely an, an opportunity there you know uh my opinion i'm going to give you another hot take here <laughs> i'm not a huge fan of like the massive gap of price between a 10 and a 9 you know how bgs 10 they go for way more than a nine because mm -hmm. for me from my personal opinion um the difference between the nine and a ten we're talking minuscule differences that from most people's perspective they're not even going to be able to spot the difference maybe you hold up the card and you look at the corner you can see some whitening but at the end of the day you're essentially seeing the exact same card 99 percent of the time in terms of quality differences you know it's practically the exact same card and so for a lot of people, I tell them, hey, man, it, unless you're a diehard collector who is absolutely needing perfection, go for that nine and save yourself the money. So <laughs> I um, yeah, one of the biggest gaps is the Shadowless Charizard. Yep, this one right here, actually, in my background, mm -hmm. that's a nine that I pulled from mm -hmm. a pack myself. Yeah, it is by far better than the four or five tens that I have traded. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Which is hysterical to me. Um, it's not always the case, obviously, with, yeah, with every card, obviously, yeah. but, but there are plenty of instances where there are nines that aren't only just as close to being as good as the tens, but better <laughs> than the yeah. tens. And I, I think, mean, that's, I, that's what people have to realize is like the grading companies, it's an opinion. It's not a, yeah. a consistent, perfect standard. It's somebody looking exactly. at the card and giving their own opinion. Exactly. Uh, we trust their opinion, and I believe in the credibility of these companies. But right. at the end of the day, the margins between these cards are very, very narrow. So at the end of the day, if you have the money and you can't afford a 10, go for it. But I would say a 9 is going to be just as good. That's why yeah. you were going for the, the 9 set for the screen promos. It's just as good to you. You don't need the 10s. So right. same same kind of scenario. And we, you and I both know there are people out there that 
will send in their cards five, six, multiple times to try and get that 10 because it's such a large jump in difference yeah. that it's worth it for them to crack it open every time and just send it again for that potential 10. All right, which I will do. I haven't done it yeah. yet with my Charizard, but I will do. Yeah. Like that's <laughs> that's how that's how it's done in, in the business, unfortunately. Um so you you uh you 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 preach and you are a a strong hobbyist. You love this yeah. this thing, you know, Pokemon as a as a hobby, but you also give um some pretty unfiltered hot takes um yeah, and, and investment advice in a way. Um how do you balance that i mean i'm sure people come at you and will talk crap about it which absolutely no matter what you do or say people will will absolutely will talk talk poorly but how how do you do that is this just something you like to do is it something that like, like just like throwing out uh advice i mean is it are you very focused on the advice you give is what you really do how transparent are you with with all that i would say i'm absolutely like 100 transparent so the way I see my content and how I am as a collector is that I am your friendly neighborhood collector, someone who's next door, who's really passionate about it. You know what I mean? Someone, imagine someone that's super passionate about sports, right? Their opinion's not going to be perfect, but you know that they like what they like. You know, my content is transparent. I have cards that I like and I have cards that I don't like, but you can trust me to know that I like what I like. You can very easily look at my content and say, okay, I know this guy's perspective. I know his opinion. My opinions are opinions for a reason. They're not going to be perfect, but I have my guidance and that's what I usually go off with. And that's what people can trust me and follow me and uh, listen to my opinion because that's what it is. It's just another critique. There are sets that I don't like. There are sets that I like, but it's just another voice in the hobby that you can listen to. I wouldn't say my word is law. It is what ex exactly is, which is just some guy who collects Pokemon cards talking about it very passionately. So when I grew up, I didn't have someone else that collect Pokemon cards with me, right? I didn't have a companion or friend that really collected cards. And yeah, that's what siblings? I wanted. No. So oh, wow. I, I do have siblings, but they don't collect Pokemon cards. So okay. when I grew up and I made my content, I wanted to be that friend that you didn't have. I wanted to be wow. that guy that you can turn to and be like, oh man, I'm really excited about this set. I want to know someone else's opinion. And my opinion may be different from yours, but you're just excited to hear me talk about it because it's another voice that you can listen to. So people will turn, tune into me and just listen to me talk or open up packs while they're opening up packs themselves. And so that they can just feel involved in the hobby, right? They just want to be a part of the hobby with someone. And I want to be that person where I can say, hey, man, are you collecting cards? And people will comment about it and I'm happy to reply. So I'm that friend that collects Pokemon cards with you. And my opinion that's, can differ from yours, yeah. but I'm here with you. That's that's wholesome. That's nice. That's yeah. I, that's not a spin I've heard before. Like I wanting to be that brother, be that companion, be that friend to collect with. That's a great. That's a great slow. You, you need to figure out how to word that properly and throw that out on your uh, on your descript your, your bio or something if it's not already there. Um, it's funny how it's perceived in Pokemon. Like yeah. you have all these sport gambling betters uh that throw out their advice and people follow and they're right they're wrong a lot of times but mm -hmm. when it comes to pokemon to a child a card game if mm -hmm. you start throwing out advice like this you get ridiculed it's, absolutely you know obviously it's good to tell people like hey be careful listening to this advice and it's not i'm not a financial advisor blah 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 are you a financial advisor what, what <laughs> what's your 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 career yeah, for sure. So I'm a full-time data analyst, so very okay. similar. So it does come into play every now and again, where yeah. I'm looking at a lot of raw data and seeing where things go in terms of trends and whatnot. But at the end of the day, uh, I my advice is about as good as your next door neighbor's advice when it comes to sports. Same idea, right? You yeah. can ask them, hey, who do you think is going to win the Super Bowl? They're going to give their hot takes. They might not be right, but they're passionate about it. And that's yeah. what you. that's why you ask them that. You're not expecting them to have the right answer you just want to hear another person's opinion right and I, you know it's it's growing and as the hobby gets bigger and mm -hmm. more of us do this you know it'll be a more uh, accepted you know thing a more normal thing for people to to talk about what they like and it not be a um an end-all be-all like crazy bit of advice uh so that's uh yeah, I hope we get to that point. I mean, I hope we get to a lot of different points with Pokemon. We finally hit 
the trending page, you know, Pat Flynn hitting the trending page, Pokey yep. Rev, um, Leonhard, you know, these guys hitting the trending pages finally on YouTube. So it's become a bigger part of content. Uh, what's, what's your, I noticed you just started doing some live streams. Mm -hmm. What's your plan or outlook, uh, with the twice baked Jake channel with your content? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, content for me has always been a hobby. So I would make content when I want to. So whenever I make a video, it's because I want to talk about something or I want to open something. It's never because I have to make a video. So that's the difference between me is that when I make something, it's because I really want to do it. And so you're I've not been... uploading on a consistent schedule? No. Yeah. <laughs> and you have 123,000 that... subs? Exactly. Trust me. <laughs> Trust me. When you're the dream. Creators... <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> when content cre creators come by my place and they look at my setup and they're like, wait, you're recording on a five-year-old mobile device your microphone is 20 bucks you got a ten dollar tripod what are you doing and i'll tell them you know that's what i am you can trust me because that's how wholesome and normal i am i'm yeah. i happen to have a camera and i happen to have a voice and a channel but then at the end of the day that's all it is people can tune into it if they want so are you pretty frugal in your real life outside of oh yeah your, oh yeah your pokemon spending habits oh absolutely pokemon yeah. is where i spend a lot of money but at my normal day life, you know, my flannel is like $15 from Walmart. You know, yeah. my table back there is a hand me down from my sister. So it's all super basic generic stuff. Amazing. Incredible. Yeah. Um, I think you're the only person that I know <clears throat> who yeah. actually bought a house. <laughs> yeah. I, myself included, mm -hmm. I've talked with so many friends. I think I brought, I forget who I talked about this with old school Pokemon, mm -hmm. I think, Nick. We have put away so many separate down payments for a house through Pokemon yeah. and told ourselves, told our friends, Hey, I'm selling this cause I want to buy a house and we've mm -hmm. never done it, <laughs> but you might be the one and only who actually did it. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, was that part of a, I forget, was that part of a challenge you were doing on YouTube or was it just like a thing you were doing privately and then, and then shared with everybody? I forget. Yeah. It's uh, something I did privately, but I shared with everyone because it sort of ties into almost a dream that people have because yeah. everyone has that dream of having Pokemon cards and having it be worth enough money someday that they can make it into a livelihood for their their family, right? And so I'm recently engaged. I have a partner. We're probably going to look to have a family soon, you know, grow a family of our own. And so with that in mind, I sold off a portion of my collection to purchase a property. And I know that's something you talked about how people just can't commit to. I, I had to, I have a family, <laughs> so I have to take care of them. I tell people this all the time, you know, you know, the most important thing isn't going to be Pokemon. At the end of the day, if I need to sell my, off my collection to support my family, oh, it, I wouldn't even have a question about it. Absolutely, yeah. I would do it. So we needed to buy a property and that's what we did. And that's a fun thing too, because the, I would say the bank does not like it when you're selling trading cards to fund for a house because they definitely <laughs> dig into that. They'll yeah. look into my eBay account. They'll say, Hey man, you got money coming in from Google. What is that? And so you have to actually <laughs> explain to them what content creation is. Why do you sell off trading cards and how do you get $30,000 from that? And it's yeah. not money, money laundering. It's pretty much just the answer. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's still such a, a crazy thing to so many people. Congratulations on the, on yeah, the engagement, thank you so much. by the way. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I remember one time I I handed like a 200 and some thousand dollar check um, to 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 my bank. And they're like, oh, you're you buying a house? I'm like, oh, <laughs> no, I'm just paying a, a friend his portion of a Pokemon deal. Yeah. <laughs> they're like, what? And <laughs> no, nothing ever happened after that. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's 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 absurd the amount of money that yep. um, we spend and and transact with in Pokemon now. Because like you said, you know, back in the day, you're spending 10 bucks, spending a hundred bucks. Like I remember first time spending a hundred dollars, first time spending a thousand dollars. And it was like, I, I was sweating. I was shaking. I didn't know what I was doing with my life because I had a normal job and it's, you know, really tough to save a hundred bucks, a thousand bucks. It's really tough yeah. to save that. And here I am now spending 10 grand, a hundred grand. Uh, that's a rare, very rare instance, but 
you know, 10 grand at a time. And it's just like a normal thing for me now. Um, I, I completely know. get that. I, thankfully, you know, it's, it's kind of started to bleed in other parts of my life a little bit. Thankfully I'm able to control it, but also there are other areas where I'm just like, I'm still incredibly frugal and cheap. <laughs> I will not, you know, spend five bucks on shipping or whatever. Oh yeah. But when it comes to I, Pokemon, it's just whatever. <laughs> I completely get that. I think when I was definitely in my college time, and you know you're you're watching eBay auctions, you're tracking prices, you're doing your research to make sure you're getting the absolute best deal possible. You're trying to snipe auctions, and you would second guess yourself on every purchase you make, where you go, yeah. "Did I overspend on this? Can I even afford this?" <laughs> All of those questions, I completely get you. Yeah, yeah, Tad, I need I need a little bit more for an extra textbook for this other yeah. class. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, yeah, it's 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 so crazy. Um, I can't like, I can't fathom what's going to happen. Um, cause I'm, I'm at the point now again, where I really do want to get a house. <laughs> so I, I'm saying it again to, to myself and to everyone like, all right, I'm going to put this stuff aside, get ready to buy a house when I can and settle down a little bit. But, uh, it's just, it's, it's so crazy. Um, I mean, I've, I've dived in completely my life into Pokemon, Yep. And I, you know, I, I quit the normal job to do this full time and then started working for startups um, mm -hmm. and, you know, still working for startups, but it's all within the Pokemon world. So everything yep. I do is Pokemon, Pokemon, Pokemon. I cannot get away from it. Right. Um, how do you do with with uh, screen time, with with being on your phone too much and, and watching YouTube? I don't know how much content you consume, but uh, are you are you, you feel like you're in a healthy relationship with with yeah. digital digital screens? Yeah, for me, it's a little bit different from other people because I'm passionate about it. So yeah. when I watch someone's content and I, you know, I watch your podcast, I watch other people talk about Pokemon cards and I watch it because I want to, I enjoy it. To me, it's not a job, right? For me, I'm watching because I, or listening because I want to. And I just enjoy hearing other people talk about the hobby and seeing what your perspective are and seeing how that differ from mine. You know, when I was listening to you and Pokey Rev talk, I could relate to just about everything you guys were saying because I'm so into it as well. Like every little topic you guys touch on, I was like, that's the same with me. Yeah. And I love that. I absolutely love that. So when, and I get inspired by that. Every time when someone puts out a piece of content, that inspires me to make my own version of it or take a spin on it or say, oh, that's a brilliant idea or that's a great topic. Why is no one digging in on that? So to me, I don't have to see it as work. You know, I'm not out here grinding and saying, I got to look at all this content to uh, find additional things to do. I can make videos whenever I feel like it. And so I just am waiting to be inspired by you guys. Cool. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. All right. So thank you. Um, are you, so yeah, I think you've done, you've only done a few lives. Is that something you're going yep. to continue with? Do you see, Yeah. Is, are, are you enjoying that? Are lives fun oh, yeah. for you? I have been wanting to do live streams for two or three years now. And I've just been holding back on it. You know, why? it's like you with your podcast. Exactly. Like why? Well, I kept making an excuse. I kept making an right. excuse. I, I said something like, I, oh, I don't have a setup yet. I don't have enough room. I don't have the space. And really all I did was I bought a webcam. I bought a mic and I started live streaming. I said, it's that easy. I should just do it. No more excuses. And I just started doing the live streams. And I, there's so much I want to talk about. There's so many things that are interesting that it's really hard to do in a YouTube video content. For example, we, I recently did a video where uh, we just ranked every single alt art card from mm -hmm. the Sword and Shield era. That's something I wanted to do. So that's something that I want to discuss with my viewers and just say, hey, which artworks do you guys like the most? And that's not something you can do in a YouTube video content. It has yeah. to do in a live format. And so I'm really happy that I was able to add that into my content. Yeah, live streaming is a lot of fun. I used to do it quite yeah. a bit. Um, I would do like morning search for Pokemon card streams and on Japanese websites. I would do some ranking stuff like that as well. Mm -hmm. Hop into other people's live streams, like you know, and and but I, I I haven't been able to find the time to do that. It's the live streaming for me is definitely the most fun because yes. you don't have you also you don't have to edit. You don't you don't have to do all the uploading. Absolutely. You have to do any work, right? You just click a button to go live and you're done. Um, I'm sure you should put in more work to prep a video mm -hmm. or so, an idea or something, but, um, yeah, live streaming is so much fun. The, the interaction with, with the, the, um, 
the chat and, and all the viewers is, is pretty great. How, how, um, how big were your live streams? Did you get a lot of viewers? Yeah, we had around 400 viewers live, which I'm oh. happy with. I'm happy that yeah, anyone shows up. Yeah. I'm happy anyone shows up. Um, after it goes live, we get up to around like 10 or 15,000 views afterwards yeah. because people just sit down and they watch us discuss it later on. And that, that's fine with me. I'm happy that anyone is watching it. You know, if a single person's in chat, they're talking with me. That's good enough. Yeah, no, it's it's cool to see the live streaming stuff grow because, uh, you know, Rev Rev aside him being an outlier, getting thousands mm -hmm. of viewers, you know, you, you I've always paid attention and it's, you know, it used to be like 30 people would be like the max that someone would get mm -hmm. then 50, then 80, 90. And then we're seeing hundreds now. Um, yep. And I mean, that's a case too, again, of Pokemon as a group growing on YouTube, you know, you have a hundred and 23,000 subs, mm -hmm. Chloe, 60,000, Ryan, mm -hmm. 60,000, Fan Danny Phantom, 100,000. So, you know, a lot of people are really growing. Um, so that's, that's helping increase that, but it's cool to see. I hope to get back into it soon. Yeah. I just like live streaming is I'm, I'm very set now on doing this consistently and mm -hmm. doing it with a purpose because it is my career. It is what I want to do for a job. Right. Mm -hmm is Pokemon content, whatever. Um, so I, I, I want to do it, take a more methodical approach to it and be sure I, I can stay consistent and do it the, the right way. Not that there is a right way. Clearly you're mm -hmm. doing whatever you want and it's, <laughs> it's, it's doing great. So, um, there's, there's no right way, I guess, but, um, but yeah, live streaming is a lot of fun. So that's cool to see you, um, hop into that. I, I think there's a great opportunity for, Pokemon content creators to start collabing more in that yeah. live streaming space. Are you a fan of like Twitch and video game streamers and all that? Yeah, uh, I watch a lot of Twitch streamer, you know, I don't stream on Twitch, but I, I'm a fan of it. And you know, just being in the space, I'm aware of Who it. Do you watch? Oh, yeah, I watch, you know, a lot of when it comes to gaming, I'm watching League of Legends streamer. So yeah, Yasuo so was my like, favorite. Yeah, Yasuo, um, he was super popular back in the day, you know, yeah. uh, being a Yasuo one trick. I watched yeah. Double Lift, you know, Dyrus, yeah. all the OGs. Oh, gosh, um, yeah. yeah, I watched TFT streams. Oh, I, I watch all it. kinds of stuff. TFT, so that's what I used to stream. <laughs> I used to stream League of, Le League of Legends and, and TFT. Mm -hmm. I got to meet Mo because uh, I did mm -hmm. that box break at the 100 mm -hmm. Thieves Cash App mm -hmm. Compound. And I got to meet Mo and Brooke, AB, and Noah J, and a whole bunch of other hundred thieves creators, but and just seeing the the compound was super cool. But uh yeah, League of Legends I was obsessed with, put way too much time into it. Yeah, Love that here. game to death. And then when TFT came out, I played a lot of the beta and a little bit of it once it came out like fully. Um that was so much fun. I got mm -hmm. <laughs> I got Scara to to watch one of my clips on his mm -hmm. stream and I was like psyched out about that because i was a big fan of the that whole uh that whole house that he put together so yeah did, did uh, any of the content creators ever watch any of your content uh when pokemon hype was uh at its peak that happened to I, me a couple of times and i was still weir weirded out by that yeah i uh not see the con see, i was doing the podcast and it was mm -hmm. so on and off i got to meet them and sell them cards yeah. which was cool so I had the experience of talking with them. There was never really a big content um, part. Of, I mean, people, you know, would probably probably have seen it. I mean, you know, like Jarvis Johnson, mm -hmm. he's a friend of mine now. He was watching mm -hmm. mine and Squeak's podcast, and um, uh, yeah, he's a bigger bigger YouTuber. Yep. And some other, yeah, random guys. Um, that was very surreal. You know, yeah. uh, I got to have some pretty cool experiences, which you know, some people view as clout chasing. Mm -hmm. I view it as again, really fun, cool experiences where I was mm -hmm. at, you know, hanging out with Steve Aoki, selling him Pokemon cards. I was yep. on the phone with, um, whoever, like Logan Paul, like mm -hmm. we all have our opinions about him, but it was mm -hmm. just like a surreal experience and Pokemon yeah. created that opportunity. Um, but the best part of it obviously is like being a part of the Pokemon community itself. I mean, I finally got to meet you, but yep. you know, I, I was friends with Pokey Red, but you know, before he started his YouTube channel, I was friends with cool trainer Ryan and, and Swimpoke mm -hmm. and Chemit Pokemon and all these people and squeaks. And, um, 
been able to build real friendships. And now these are the people that are like famous. I don't know if, what you want to call it in the Pokemon world. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a really cool experience to have seen your friends grow into what they are today, whether it is oh, a creator, a, a, a top 10 eBay seller, whatever it is. Um, and it was all done by Pokemon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, cool. You know, I remember when Pokey Chloe was at, you know, like 5,000 subscribers and Danny was under 10 K and all these YouTubers were really small. And I was rooting for every last one of them. I was like, yeah. whenever they reach a milestone, I feel like I was cheering for them the whole entire time. And I'm so happy that they were re able to reach those numbers. And, you know, yeah. like when Danny reached hundred K, I congratulated him. We never have any co communication. I've never oh. communicated with him. I've never talked with him, but we know our content because we're practically colleagues. So yeah. whenever he reached a hundred K, I was just happy for him. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, it's great. Um, I, I like truly understand the crazy fandom and like yeah. that, that fan to creator connection where you just really are like proud of them to hit a certain point. Cause you've been watching them for so long and seeing them start and struggle. Mm -hmm. Um, it's really cool. <laughs> I, I love it. Um, so are, are you going to be able to, to start going out to, to more events? I mean, that, that was your first event, right? Card party. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was my first event. You know, I'm close to Pat. He yeah. reached out to me and said, uh, he would love to have me there and, you know, say no more. I'm there. He yeah. didn't need to do anything. He had me as soon as he said, Hey, I'm, I'm going for sure. So I wanted to definitely support the content. I definitely want to support him, uh, the community as well. It was great to just see, you know, so many people who would come up and say like, Hey, I watch your content, a huge fan, or be able to meet some people that they've been waiting for to, to just see me, which is crazy. You know, like I'm not someone that I ever expect to be recognized in any way. <laughs> so seeing someone who's literally shocked to see me, uh, I'm happy to be there for them. That, and yeah, that was a really big goal. I think, I think we were all shocked to see you. We didn't yeah. think you, you, uh, you left the house. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Outside of the footage from my little studio here, you never see me outside. Yeah. <laughs> well, we got to, we got to sit on a panel together, um, at, at card party. Um, it was like a, I don't even remember what it was. It was like an investment panel or like what the future of Pokemon panel. Yeah. Uh, it was, uh, it was see, a little rough, but yeah, see, I wanted to talk to Pat about that. I would love to do more panels, but the panels yeah. that I would want to do is almost, um, fun games or interactions with fans yeah. or viewers where I can say, Hey, let's do Pokemon Jeopardy. Let's do guest mm -hmm. Pokemon cards. Uh, let's do higher or lower. So, you know, do little mini games and I'm happy to give away cards. You know, if, if prizes are needed, I will do the giveaway myself if that's <laughs> yeah. what is needed. But those are more of the panels that I want to do is just to get people excited, get people talking about it. You know, that's all it really takes. Panels. So panels, um, I, I don't know, uh, only knowing within the Pokemon space, panels have been the most difficult thing to find success with. Yeah. And this sure. is what I talked to Pat with about um, even like prior. I was like, it looks like you're doing everything great. Um, I know this is going to crush it, but the panels are going to be questionable. And yes. I think I... I I was right about it. I still haven't talked to him about it. I'm, I, I'm sure I'll be recording with him soon. Uh, yeah. Have, have him on the podcast and talk about it more. But uh, panels are just difficult. It's hard to like grab the attention of people to get them there. You really need to get the people who are a part of it to promote it. Um, and they only want to promote it really if they're doing something fun, like you said, like that's exactly. enjoyable. I mean, um, make sure the right people are there together that that meld well with you know that, that uh that work very well together um can can you know have that banter and and yeah you know panels are just like they're boring <laughs> i mean you're just sitting there talking um and and unless you have something there for the fans to truly engage with outside of a q and a it's like why are they going to come when they can go look at cards or go exactly go find pokey rev uh wait in line to get his autograph yeah <laughs> that's why i would love to do more interactions with them yeah 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 so that that's the one thing that i think will forever be challenging for mm -hmm. for especially the pokemon events i'm sure it's challenging with other industry events um but it's yeah i, I think it does rely a lot on the people who are in the panel to get their fans there 
which I mean, I didn't have any fans at, <laughs> at card party, but um, you know, so it's, it's, uh, it's great though. I was a big fan of that, of mm -hmm. that event that Pat did a great job. I hope that um, we, you know, he can get another one going and, and have it be even more successful. Um, find, find a way to profit off of it. I'm sure it was, you know, a pretty big investment for the first one and first couple will be investments. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, right. but we're at a point where we have a designated Pokemon card convention, you know, that was not a thing that we had a couple of years ago. So I'm, I'm shocked by the growth in the hobby and the community and, uh, what people are willing to do. You know, we were able to fill the convention center of people just excited to open up Pokemon cards and talk about Pokemon cards. And that's insane to me because how do you fill two or three days worth of content around a trading card game? But we did it. And you're absolutely right. I think that first convention was really just to showcase that it was possible. You know, it was almost a test run mm -hmm. and to prove that this model has potential here. And yeah. this is something that can, can grow in the future where you have additional trading card conventions that people are just excited to go to, to meet content creators and have this little event for two days where people are just excited to connect. Yeah. Have you not gone to any of the ones in Vegas? I mean, there's, I guess they've only had really like the mint collective, which is more of a corporate -y yeah. type. There's trading event. cards event, but this is a Pokemon card event, right? And that's rare. <laughs> well, we can't, we can't say it's a Pokemon event. They'll shut it down. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we have to keep it. We have to keep it a card event. Mm -hmm. um, Pokemon will, will go after you if it's, mm -hmm. if it's a, a Pokemon centric thing. So, um, have you, have you met Gary? Do you know Gary since you're out in Vegas? No, I've only moved here around uh, three months ago. So I've oh. always been located in Reno. So okay. we just recently moved here into a proper, you know, proper house, you know, yeah. with actual bedrooms and, uh, and bathrooms <laughs> and all that. So I'm happy about it. But I yeah. know there's a ton of content creators uh, here. I know Steve Aoki is here. I know a lot yeah. of the big collectors are within the area. So yeah, I'm happy to connect with Graham, them. Graham Steffen's out there too. He collects yeah. Pokemon oh, yeah. a little bit. Um, if I come out, I'll have to try to, I'll, I'll at least introduce you to Gary. Um, yeah, absolutely. Try to get that together. We can, we can get lunch or dinner or something together. Uh, I, I haven't, yeah, I used to go out like once or twice a month just to spend time with them because um, mm -hmm. it was so crazy at the time. But I, I haven't been in probably over a year now. I went to, mm -hmm. uh, I think the last time I went was the Pokemon Saves the World event that they put on. Um, if you remember that. Yeah debacle it was it was a great <laughs> event it was just such mm -hmm. a mess with the uh the, the pack opening it was a disaster it was terribly um planned but the event itself was like yeah. beautiful they had cool little pokemon snacks and like uh -huh. fun things to do on the side and it, it was it was a, a cool experience they just needed yeah. to, to plan out the pack opening a little bit better because it was yeah a little rough completely <laughs> understand you know once once the dollars get involved and the value gets involved, that's when the scrutiny from the, the yeah. fans and the viewers just goes through the roof. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was a first ad shadowless and unlimited base box. So when you're spending mm -hmm. half a million in value on Pokemon, you got to be very professional and careful with yeah. how you're handling that stuff. And like, yeah, any little thing wrong is up for scrutiny. Uh, so, more about your business, though. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're if you're open to sharing, you, you can sure. you can talk about as much as you want. Um, you're really so you're doing the content, mm -hmm. and then you you're treating it as a hobby, but mm -hmm. also an investment too. Clearly, buying and selling to you know mm -hmm. you bought the house with with the money, and you're sharing what you're picking up and talking about mm -hmm. values and comparisons mm -hmm. to to similar items and all that. Are you? selling like do you have an ebay business are you buying and selling quite a bit yeah are so you, i have an ebay store i'm fully transparent about that but my ebay store is a personal one so i'll put something on there as a collector you can't yeah. just go to me and just buy cards whenever you feel like it okay. i'll have cards for sale as any normal collector would but that's how i see it is if i have pieces of my collections that i want to give out then you can go onto my ebay store and see it for yourself uh, or not but that's what it is. I don't have a regular revenue stream when it comes to Pokemon cards, right? So I'm you're not, not regular... set up with a, a distributor. You don't have like no. a, okay. Yeah. So that's why I think my opinion is a little bit more unique. And, you know, yeah. I don't have that swing where I'm not tied to distributors. I'm not tied to the popularity of a specific set. 
you know, if my mm. channel had zero views, I would still be absolutely fine. So yeah. that's why I think people come and watch me is because I don't have that sway. Right. Much more relatable. Um, yeah, I, I, I have a distributor, so I just buy yeah. whatever allocation I can get for every set. It's not much. Um, mm -hmm. It it varies. It's, you know, three to six cases of booster boxes, every new set and all the extras, UPCs and, and ETBs and all that stuff. So um, I don't I mean, I, I don't really talk about that or really sell much of it because mm -hmm. I, I can't I don't have the time to and I don't have the proper right. infrastructure, like you said. <laughs> it's you have to have time and and or people to ship all your stuff and oh, take yeah. care of that and i'm working my nine to five i'm doing my podcast i buy collections great stuff sell stuff <laughs> there's so many oh, little yeah. facets of things that i have to do so the i modern, absolutely get that the modern inventory I, is just like the bottom of the totem pole for me and it just oh it just absolutely sits. it's the same with me it's the yeah. absolute worst thing. I hate listing cards. I hate <laughs> shipping stuff. I hate putting stuff in boxes and, uh, you know, actually getting it delivered to people. That's pretty much customer service. People will email me and message me and be, oh, Hey, the worst. <laughs> I, I haven't received my product yet. You know, where is it? And I'm tracking it down for them. I hate that portion. And so that's what I tell people is, you know, sometimes people think it's liquid and it's really not. So yeah. I tell people, you know, if you buy 20 ETB, just be aware that you're going to have to ship all that out. You're going to have to list it out. And that's a lot of work that they were not prepared for. They thought that yeah. they could, you know, just offload at any given time. I have $500 worth of value. That's pretty much 500 bucks, isn't it? And it's not. Right. And unless you're, and, and if you're going to a local store to cash out, you're mm -hmm. getting 70% at best mm -hmm. for them because they got to make money. Exactly. So unless you're putting in that work and setting yourself up as that final seller, Mm -hmm. um, you're not going to get the market price. You're going to get 80%, 90%, whatever it is. So there's a, yeah, there's a lot of work. <laughs> if you buy this stuff, you have to sell it at some point. Otherwise you're right. stuck with it. And when it comes to sealed product, you're very tempted to open it. I know mm -hmm. you like to open product. That's one of your favorite yeah. things. It's one of my favorite things too. Yep. Um, I spend a lot on the vintage packs. Like mm -hmm. I need to stop because of the <laughs> problem, but opening packs, especially with friends, like at card party, I pulled the first Ed Lugia. Mm -hmm. That's an experience that you just like, remember forever. It's like, Oh, you know, you open up that Lugia. Like we'll talk about that for years probably. Um, so it's just opening packs is the true pastime of, of Pokemon that I enjoy, enjoy the most. Do you, are you pretty good about controlling yourself with opening or? Yeah. Yeah. For me personally, I have a sealed collection. And so that's what I tell people is they ask me, how do you keep something sealed long term? And that's, it has to be a passion of yours. It has to be a yeah. mindset of yours that you're keeping and preserving history in a way. So for me, not opening it up brings me joy. Yeah. Seeing a product that is protected, sealed, and in mint condition for years, that brings me joy. If, if that doesn't bring you joy, you're not going to be able to keep something sealed long term. You have to be someone that enjoys seeing a sealed product. Yeah. See, my advice is open up as much as you can yeah. afford until you get bored of it. And then you'll mm -hmm. sit on, <laughs> you'll actually sit on stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, it took me a long time to rip through base set packs and jungle packs and all this stuff mm -hmm. before I was like, all right, time to really just hold on to some of this. It's cool to have it sealed. <laughs> so I'm the poor financial advice on that one. Jake's mm -hmm. the smart financial advice <laughs> on that one, uh, <laughs> but whichever way it takes. Um, yeah, yeah I, I love sealed product. I used to have a ton of it. Um, I got scared at one point with selling it because the prices mm -hmm. started to get so high, you know, thousands of dollars. I was, I sold it too early, but, um, I was worried about people buyers scamming me saying, oh, this yep. is resealed or shipping me back returns. I got, I sold a base set pack once on eBay. And mm -hmm. the guy returned a modern Pokemon card and he wrote Team Rocket Strikes Again. Mm -hmm. And eBay sided with the buyer. Mm -hmm. I sent them pictures. I told them the whole thing. And I lost, I mean, it was $100 at the time for a base set pack. Yep. Still, it was a lot of money. And it, that like, that crushed me. So I got terrified mm -hmm. and started selling all my sealed product because I didn't want to deal with that. And I moved all into graded stuff because it was just mm -hmm. easier and less... Uh, uh open to scams like that 
Um, so that's like another thing people have to consider if they're Absolutely. buying and selling this stuff. There's so many risks in this business because it's such a wild, wild west. Like it's Absolutely. not regulated at all. You have to be so careful and really understand this stuff because I've come so close to quitting because of mm -hmm. that specific instance. Yep. I was like, you know, I'm done with this. I don't want to deal with this anymore because of that one instance. But thankfully, I stayed and stuck with it because um, in the grand scheme of things, that hundred dollars meant nothing. Right. But, um, but yeah, and that's the same advice I would give someone as well is if they're trying to sell stuff uh, in terms of trading cards is that the volume eventually there, there will be time when your products get lost. There will be time when you get scammed, but that's yeah. going to be a minuscule amount of times compared to the amount of times where you actually connect with someone and make an awesome trade or an awesome sale. Cause those are going to be yeah. the more common ones. Yeah. Especially yeah. doing it long-term, you really got to yeah. stick with it for a long time. That's for any business. You have to factor in loss, theft, mm -hmm. all that stuff. Um, so that that's really important. But um, so what's your what's your next collection goal? What are you working on? Or do you have anything anything big you're you're looking at uh, obtaining? Yeah, there's a ton of cool stuff that I want to collect. You know, when it comes to vintage, unfortunately, or maybe not unfortunately, I've collected pretty much everything I wanted in terms of vintage stuff. Right? If, if there's a okay. card that I want and it's vintage, I probably already have it. So right now I'm collecting a lot of modern stuff, stuff that I've missed over the past couple of years. You know, there's major cards that I just don't have inside of my collections and I want them in mint condition. Um, so slowly building it up, there's a ton of, you know, full art promo cards from Japan that I just never got because I was doing other stuff at the time and I didn't pick them up. And now, you know, cards that were a hundred bucks or $10,000 and yeah. I'm slowly having to uh, make up for lost time pretty much. Are you, are you big on collecting graded, uh, yeah. raw in binders or... What do you yeah, prefer? you know, for a lot of the Grail cards, I want them in mint condition. So, the, so you know, so same advice. I'm being hypocritical mm -hmm. again, where now I want a PSA 10 instead of a PSA yeah. 9 for some of my Grail cards. So, yeah, for those cards, I want the mint. But, you know, same with you where you're penny pinching. If I can get a mint copy raw, ungraded, I'm going to go for that. And it's really, you know, a, it's a marathon, you know. So I'm slowly building it up. You know, if a card is available once a year, and it's the right one. That's how long I'm lurking for it. It could be a years long journey, but that's part of the fun of the, being in the hobby is hunting for these cards. Yeah, it's uh, the chase will will always be the best part of it. Once you once you get something, it's it's uh, yeah the the journey the the, the journey is what you want to really learn to enjoy because once you get your goal, it's either make a new one or you're gonna yep. sit there doing nothing. So oh yeah, uh, I've had that moment where yeah. you know I felt like I finished collecting Pikachu promo cards and I thought, you know, what's next? And then I move into four trainer cards. It's the same way even from the very beginning when I was collecting base set, jungle, and fossil. Once you start collecting some of the vintage stuff, you know, you just slowly start buying other stuff and building so, up and like, what's next? You yeah. talked about you talked about history. Mm -hmm. Is Are these things that you care about? Are you into trophy cards? Obviously, this is a modern Pikachu, but... yeah. You know, to I, me, the, the holy grail of Pokemon are the 1997 Pikachu trophy cards. Yes. Uh, the il illustrator just below that. But yeah, like obviously not very obtainable, mm -hmm. hardly ever for sale. And when they are, they're hundreds of thousands of dollars. But yep. um, do those interest you at all? Oh, yeah. I think those are super cool. I love seeing them. You know, I, I my hand would shake if I hold one inside of my uh, hands. But in general... <laughs> That's not a card that I want to have inside of my collection because yeah. just the price point of it kind of freaks me out almost a little yeah. to have it on a shelf. So while it's a cool card, I don't feel comfortable almost having it inside my collection. So it might be something that I would always want to have, but yeah. maybe it's not something that I, you know, rationally would have inside of my collection. Right. Unless you're super wealthy and exactly. can afford to collect it. Exactly. Yes. I mean, 99.9% .9 of people can only buy that card as an investment. They couldn't even mm -hmm. treat it as a collection piece. Exactly. So, um, yeah. Okay. So you do like the trophy cards. Do you have Absolutely. any, do you, do you have any of the lower end ones? Like, like a, 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 a pearl or like a, a scroll or a unicarp? I say lower end, but they're still very Yeah. Expensive. Oh yeah. Those are still like 50 to hundred K. Yeah. So those cards are super cool. I definitely thought about pulling the trigger on those a couple of times. 
but same scenario. I'm a yeah. very frugal collector. While I think it would be super cool to have it in my collection and display, you know, a really cool master scroll or something of that nature, mm -hmm. you know, I just can't see myself reasonably doing that. My collection and my background specifically has always been low budget. And I know that sounds shocking right now, but back in the day, you know, an item in my background would be a $200, $300 collectible at most, mm -hmm. you know, maybe a thousand dollar or $2,000, but now everything's gone so expensive that even as I say I'm frugal, my background is fifty, sixty thousand dollars, and that scares me. That scares me. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you have the the EV Heroes box in there. Yep. Well, that's the the collection one, right, with the two mm -hmm. boxes in it and the promo. You got the Mario's. You've got the favorite Charizard UPC. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, but you were paying retail for that at the time, right? You paid. 50 yeah, yeah. Bucks Those for were all retail box. prices item that I was yeah. spending. You know. $60, $80, $100 for these items. And now that they're super expensive, that's what worries me. You know, I'm yeah. while everyone's happy to see their collection goes up in value. Uh, to me, I always bought it because it was a display item. I bought it because I thought it looked good on display. That's literally it. I didn't care what price it was. I just thought it would look good on a shelf. So I bought it for my shelf. That's literally yeah. it. And now that it's super expensive, I've actually had to buy insurance for my collection, which I'm sure you oh. have as well. But that's not something I ever expected to do, but here I am. Yeah, it's uh, insurance. I still haven't heard of anyone actually using the collectibles insurance stuff. Like, yeah. they, obviously, I have have uh, have it set up and have friends who who have it, but I don't. I haven't heard of any instances of something going wrong and them having the claim against yeah. it. So, well, that's I'm how curious. they collect their money. It's all yeah. peace of mind. Yeah, I'm curious about that. It's uh. Like, because you can't get State Farm or like these big no. car insurance, life insurance companies to insure yeah. your Pokemon collection. You have to find a third mm -hmm. party that's kind of specific for it. So mm -hmm. I'm curious to see how that actually works, if it ever came to be, because <laughs> that's scary too. In my yeah, own, it is absolutely scary. It's something that you yeah. never expect to use. You know, you have it yeah. to give you that peace of mind, but you yeah. never want to actually have to use your insurance to claim or anything of that nature because at the end of the day you probably still want your collection you yeah. probably still want it yeah a lot of it is uh irreplaceable like exactly the, the charizard i pulled that myself i don't yeah. want like i want that one i don't want exactly one. you know um so there's there's instances like that where it's just there it's hard to put a value on it so yeah well what what else is going on in the world of twice baked jake are you expanding into other social medias are you gonna are you just chilling with youtube yeah right now i absolutely love youtube i love the content on there in terms of where i think the future goes you know there's twitch there's tiktok there's instagram but i still think that youtube is probably my favorite platform to just make mm -hmm. content on and so i'm gonna stick with it i think i'm here for the long term and yeah i would love to do more live stream right now what i'm currently working on I'm building out a lot more additional guides and helpful content to other viewers. You know, I feel like my content has dipped a little too deep into um, doing content for myself where I'm speaking too much about, on my own opinion. I'm opening mm -hmm. up too much products and I'm not making helpful content to viewers. Mm -hmm. So I want to move towards that where I can say, hey, here's where you can start collecting. Here's how you can start collecting base set. Okay. Here's how you can sleeve your cards. Doing a little bit more of those helpful guides that I still think people want to hear more information on. Yeah, I, you know, that's, it's it, a lot of people want to do that. They try to do that, but it's hard to gain a voice by only doing that. Yeah. Since you've already created that voice, created the fan base, it'll be much more valuable um, for them and for you as well, since it's, the fan base is already there. Um, so yeah, that's definitely something that's been lacking. Um, I mean, you, you can go back and watch eight year old videos of how to grade cards and how to right. properly sleeve them and take care of them. But you know, no one's made any updated new ones. So that would be cool. That'd be good. That'd be a nice little line of content to, to create for, for the, uh, for the community. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. I, uh, I appreciate you, uh, hopping on, uh, great. Finally get into to meet you at card party, getting to meet you here, talk to you a little bit about Likewise. the world of, of twice baked Jake. Um, so, uh, for those who, who tuned in this long, be sure to follow, 
uh, Jake all over the, I mean, you do have an Instagram and all that stuff, right? I don't know. Yeah, I do. I I have an Instagram. I have a Twitter, but I'm the most active on YouTube. If you message me a a comment on any video, I'm almost 100% likely to to at least see it. And that's crazy. You, you need to stop that. (laughs) Yeah. I still read almost every single comment, no matter how good, how bad it is. Even if it's a critique, I might even heart it if it's a critique, you know, people said I have a, terrible squeaky voice or anything of that nature i'll still heart your comment and thank you so much for you know commenting pretty much wow that's awesome Mm -hmm. that's that's a tough mentality to have so that's good well thank you again jake i really Mm -hmm. appreciate it and uh i wish you the best of luck with your continued uh randomness with youtube (laughs) likewise thank you so much for having me it's been a fun conversation i love talking to you and uh, i love having connections like this. So I would yeah. love to be on again if you ever want me in the future. So thank you so awesome. much. Thank you. Yep. We'll, uh, we'll talk soon.